Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I apologize, I have not been uh, very active up here for a while, but here we are. So we are going to summarize the situation concerning COVID-19 uh, worldwide, and then I have some updates concerning the treatment as well. So we need to talk about a lot of numbers and let's dive right into it. So I have here is the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. And by the way, this video is made very late on May the 3rd, 2020. The data you are seeing on the WHO is actually May the 4th, 2020. And of course, the WHO is not located in America. So we have a different timeline, different date. We are standing at over 3. Point, almost 3.4 million confirmed cases worldwide, 90,000 cases uh, that are new, and we have almost 240,000 deaths reported so far by the WHO. If we scroll down to the curve here, we are actually seeing that the pandemic started um, to shoot up from March the 1st to April the 1st, and it has probably plateaued somewhere at the middle of April. And what we're seeing now is the slowing of the numbers. And yet, um, this is what we call the plateau. So it is probably already peaked. And the deaths over time, almost 240,000, uh, we are seeing the peak somewhere around mid-April. And we are having a downward trend of the uh, death rates, uh, with exception of around the end of April. We have a little blip of increase here. Uh, so these numbers are by the WHO, and the WHO is always a beat behind. So we are going to go to the Center of Disease Control, or the CDC, and this situation is more important for the United States. We are standing at 1.1 million cases, with almost 30,000 cases for May the 3rd, 2020, and we are talking about over almost... 66,000 deaths, and uh, in the state of Virginia where I live, we are at almost uh, 18,000 cases. But in fact, if you go to the Department of Health, Virginia Department of Health to be precise, we are at 18, almost 19,000 cases of COVID-19, to which we have over 660 deaths and over 2,600 hospitalizations. And we look at county per county, there's only three counties in the United States. Last there was five, but there are only three counties now in, you, in Virginia, rather, that do not report any cases of COVID-19. Fairfax was the most heavily hit with over 4,300 cases, followed by uh, Prince William, over 2,000 cases, and then Loudoun at 931. If we look at the curves in Virginia in particular, we probably see the potential peak here at the end of April, and we expect the numbers to probably plateau or going down from the weeks to come. So that is a bit of good news for people who live in Virginia like myself. But overall, the situation in the United States is by no means out of the woods. So here is another very interesting website I want to present to you guys. It's actually by the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, SUTD, uh, the so-called Data Driven Innovation Lab, and they are using mathematical equations and also um, a world data from different universities, including Washington, Texas, Imperial College of London, and MIT, and they actually put together different curves of different countries, and as you can see here, worldwide, uh, they predict the really downward trend of the pandemic which probably would happen at the beginning of June and also at the end of June. Uh, for the United States, they actually predict the pandemic would be significantly uh, improved by June and also um, towards the end of June or the beginning of July. Uh, things were probably not going to go back according to a theoretical, theoretical ending on uh, October the 1st, 2020. So these are estimates. These change all the time. It depends on the number of cases coming in and on, depending on the data. But as you can see, we are shortly, we are certainly not out of the woods. We are just plateauing uh, and things are not immediately better. Uh, if we're not careful, this curve will probably bounce back pretty rapidly. So the second study coming out of France by Dr. Raoul 
uh, from Marseille concerning the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And I have the study right here, which I'm going to post it online for you so you can also look at it. But the data is much more than the initial study that was done uh, prior with 26 patients. The second study actually involved 1,061 patients. And I will show you uh, what are the numbers that Dr. Raoul actually posted uh, on his uh, study. So basically a cohort of 1,061 patients of COVID-19 and they were given in the uh, they were given the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for at least three days, and they follow these people for at least nine days. And their endpoint, the endpoint of the study is actually deaths or worsening of the viral shedding persistence. And the study actually lasted from March the third to April the ninth, and they actually screened about sixty thousand people, and in which a 1,061 people actually met the criteria for the study, and they use, uh, I'm sorry, they calculate the mean age was 43.6 years of age, to which 46.4% were males, and 91.7% uh, had a clinical outcome that was favorable, and that justified by having a virological or virus clearance or virus cure in 973 people or patients within 10 days. And he considered people who took more than 10 days to cure was a poor outcome. Uh, so five people have died, 10 people were transferred to the intensive care unit, and it represents a fatality rate of 0.47% uh, between the age of 74 and 95 years old. Uh, 31 people require more than 10 days hospitalizations. And uh, so far from the study, he indicates that the cure rate from COVID-19 is 98% among all of the patients so far. But it is important to um, notice that there is no control arm in the study. So it is an observational study. Uh, it is an open label study. So the researchers, the doctors know exactly who the patients are. The patients know exactly what they, they were getting in terms of uh, medications. So there was no double-blinded trial. There was no control. So it is an observational open label study. Um, there are many studies like this ongoing right now. There's one in Minnesota right now, and we're going to find the result uh, of that study in the following weeks to come. So another study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, concerning uh, remdesivir, compassionate use for remdesivir in the severe COVID-19 patients. And this study was published around April 2020. Basically, the method of this study was to use remdesivir on a compassionate use basis to patients who was hospitalized with COVID-19. And basically, the uh, result indicate in 61 patients who received at least one dose of remdesivir, and uh, they observed how these patients were doing over uh, several days. Uh, involved 22 patients in the United States and 22 patients in Europe or Canada. And basically, the conclusion of the study is that uh, in the cohort of hospitalized severe COVID-19 patients using remdesivir, they observed clinical improvement in 68% of patients, which is quite significant. But again, this study was actually funded by the pharmaceutical company Gilead or Gilead, and there is no control arms, there's no placebo control arms in this study. Now, the one published by NIH is a little bit different. So the preliminary result from the NIH indicate that the patient who received from Desivir had a 31% faster recovery time than those who received placebo. And specifically, the median time to recover was 11 days for patients treated from Desivir compared to 15 days for those who were treated with a placebo. So this time they did have a control group, which was placebo. And the res results suggested that the survival benefit and the mortality rate of 8% in the group receiving remdesivir versus 11.6% in the placebo group. And that study had a statistically significant a finding in the usage of remdesivir in COVID-19. So remdesivir is now uh, confirmed with a double-blinded trial that it is beneficial in COVID-19 patients. 
The NIH panel also came out with a recommendation not too long ago uh, that they recommend against the usage of combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And uh, I find it quite amazing that uh, they, are, they are actually against such treatment that has been proven in France that it might be beneficial. Remember guys, when penicillin was invented in 1945, uh, for military use and approved for civilian use in 1947. That study only had 10 patients. So that was back in the 40s. Um, we have here two studies. One study was 26 patients and the second study was 1,061 patients. So that is significantly more than 10 people that we had for penicillin back in the 40s. And uh, this is just me presenting to you that among the NIH panel, that recommended against the usages of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Nine of those uh, re, uh, researchers on the NIH panel work for Gilead. Okay, nine of them. And uh, Gilead stocks went through the roof when they came out with the study of remdesivir, which cost thousands of dollars per dose versus hydroxychloroquine uh, costs almost nothing. And azithromycin or z pack costs almost nothing. So something to uh, keep in mind. Um, the American College of Cardiology also came out with a study uh, recommend the risk of ventricular arrhythmia, risk due to hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin treatment for COVID-19. So you can read the study, but basically the recommendation in this study uh, and this article is to be very careful in combination of the two because as I explained in the past two videos, the combination of these two medications actually increase the risk of prolonged QT syndrome and that would lead to um, increased risk of fatal ventricular arrhythmia and that can actually lead to sudden cardiac death. So basically American College Cardi Cardiology does not recommend against the usage of uh, these two medications but rather recommend to be extremely be careful with these two medication and that patients who uh, are treated with this combination uh, ought to have a serious discussion with their physician they should get an ekg done and they should have uh, blood work done to determine their uh, electrolytes mainly the magnesium the potassium the sodium and also uh, People should not self-medicate with this medication. In some countries, uh, they can actually find this medication over the counter very easily. So the newest kit on the block at this point is actually convalescent plasma. And that basically is when you extract the plasma from an infected and recovered patient and you spin down the plasma, you extract the antibodies out and you would then transfer these antibodies into a newly infected COVID-19 patient that is still going on and we should find out the result of that study in the weeks to come. Also, they are also using into, uh, interleukin-6 inhibitor as I discussed in my previous two videos and that is to basically reduce or prevent the so-called cytokine storm in hospitalized COVID-19 patients and it also seems to have promising result. Now, uh, the combination of HIV medication, namely lopinavir and ritonavir, that was uh, showing very promising uh, sign in the beginning, uh, turned out to be not uh, as promising. So that combination of treatment is actually falling out of favor. And uh, there is also a uh, article by the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine also presented to prove that that combination is not statistically significant meaning that it is not much better compared to the placebo study. So that combination is falling out of favor and is no longer being considered in the pipeline. Now the vaccine is currently in the work and we are still months away, uh, but hopefully by the fall or the winter, hopefully we should have a much better answer or um, idea on how soon a vaccine should be available. So. These are the uh, latest update concerning COVID-19 and uh, I will see you back as soon as possible. Thank you for listening.